we cannot thank you enough. For where you have brought us, oh God. In the name of Jesus, we all have a testimony, Lord. How that at one time we were lost in sin. Could have died there. But you were there with us. As lost. As lost as we were, there you were. And we thank you and give you praise, Lord. God, we cannot thank you enough for the reality of you. We just praise your holy name. We ask, Lord, that Holy Spirit would speak to us today. Give us a message, Lord. Something to receive in our spiritual stomachs, Lord, and to digest and to to receive the power of it and the hope of it and the blessing of it. Oh God, in Jesus' name, thank you and give you praise. It appears from scripture and this song comes from Revelation chapter 4 the message to the churches have been concluded in chapters 1 to 3 and the Apostle John hears the voice of the Lord say come up hither that is the resurrection of the holy dead and those of us who are alive and remain and when we get there we will hear and see those angels crying holy 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 lord god almighty who was who is and is to come and the elders will cast their thrones crowns before the throne of God and the roar of praise was like many 
rivers of water. Praise your holy name, O God. Praise your holy name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. be seated. We have spent the last four, five, six weeks on coming to the reality of spiritual warfare, learning that We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And God tells us to put on the whole armor of God that we may be able to stand And speak with the authority that the Lord Jesus Christ has given us. Luke 9, chapter 9, you'll find it, you read it. Behold, I give you authority to trample on serpents and on scorpions and over all the power of the enemy And nothing by any means will hurt you. We need to realize that the true reality of the warfare that is going on in the earth is both demonic and angelic. We spoke about how there are only two kingdoms in this world. The kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. The kingdom of darkness will come to its end. And the kingdom of darkness can only do what God allows it to do. And what you and I allow it to do. And we are in that kingdom of light. Walking out Psalms 91. They that dwell in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord that he is my refuge. He is my fortress. He is my God. In him will I put my trust. And we have also talked about how that we need to come to a greater revelation of who is in us. When we were born again, Deaconess Miller read that text, when we were born again, the Spirit of God himself, the Spirit of Christ, came within us. We are talking about the word that was made flesh, came to live within us. All of us who have been born again, we have within us the God of the universe. The fullness of him became our fullness. And God said in John, the 14th chapter, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. And Jesus said this, And we will come and abide within you. And we need to know. We need to come to a greater recognition of who we are in Christ and who Christ is in us and the grace that he has given us to be victorious in this world. Amen. Amen. You know, a lot of us, we were raised to be 
self-thinkers, self-doers, you know, I'm going to do this for the Lord, and I'm going to do that for the Lord. And that sounds good, but y'all, there's not much we can do for God. <laughs> God's got everything. God's got everything. And we need to come to the reality that whatever our giftings and callings are, we need to learn to let the Lord operate through them. We, we, without him operating through them, there's no power. There's, his presence is not there. We are, we are, we, our intentions are good, but it is God who worketh in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure. In other words, he's saying, Chester, just get out of the way and let me take care of this, would you? And you know what I say to the Lord? Yes, Lord, yes. <laughs> oh, I tell you, we serve such a wonderful and loving God. And we just praise you, Lord. We thank you and give you praise. We have also learned in those weeks where we are prophetically. In Ezekiel 34 and verses 11 through 13, the word of the Lord came to Ezekiel saying that I will gather back my people from the places from whence they have gone. And this happened, this happened during uh, the siege of Israel when Nebuchadnezzar came in and took uh, Judah to uh, uh, Babylon. And for 70 years they were there. But then God issued a decree through Artaxerxes and, and called the people back to Israel. So we're talking somewhere around 517 B.C. And then God sent his son. In the beginning was the word. And the word was God. And the word was with God. He came unto his own, but his own received him not. And yet he persevered, knowing that if he did not do what God had sent him to do, mankind by and large would have been lost. Old Testament believers, if they made it to heaven, they made it because as as the Lord said in Deuteronomy, and Abraham believed. He believed God. Though he sinned, yet he believed God. That's what all of those, those uh, uh, ceremonial sacrifices were about. Uh, the scapegoat carrying away the sins and all of that. But they were just types and shadows of the Lord Jesus Christ who was to come. And he came. He came and he gave his life. It wasn't taken. He gave his life for the sins of the whole world. He was nailed to that cross from the third and to the sixth hour. Darkness covered the face of the earth. As Father God began to heap upon Jesus the sins of those past, the sins of those present, and the sins of us future. He bore our sins. And when it was time, he said, it is finished. The redemption of lost mankind is finished. I have done what the Father has told me to do. And he gave up the spirit and he went down into hell. For the wages of sin is? He paid our debt there. 
When we get to heaven, I'm going to ask God, I want to see your son walking around in hell. Because anyone else who went there, they were tortured, they were horrified, they were in fire, as the rich man in Lazarus tells us, they were in fire. And yet, here's this man in hell, and he doesn't burn. He's obviously not afraid. And then on the third day, there was a great earthquake as Jesus rose from the dead. And for 40 days, he was seen of the disciples and many others. And at one time, 500 people saw him. It, it's, it's just real. God did what he said he was going to do. But going back unto his own received him not, the only time that the Lord Jesus wept that we know of was when he was preaching and teaching to them. And he said, if only you had known the time of your visitation, that I come here to save you and to redeem you, And because you have rejected me as your Messiah in 70 years, in the, uh, not 70 years, but he completes the prophecy, part of the prophecy of Daniel 9, 27, where the prince, where the prince of the enemy would come into Jerusalem and destroy it. And indeed that happened and they were spread, the Jews were spread out all over the world. But then came another prophecy, I will gather them from the north, the north, the south, the east, and the west. And I will make Israel a country again. And I will make Jerusalem a capital again. Isaiah set forth the question, can a nation be born in a day? Well, on May 14, 1948, in a day. First time it's ever happened in the history of mankind and hasn't happened since. In a day, Israel was reborn. 1967, the Six Days War in which... From a natural standpoint, there was no way Israel could take on all of those uh, Arab nations and win. But God intervened, and they took back East Jerusalem, and they wept, and they wept because of what God did. There's so many miraculous things happening in that. If you ever want to do some research, it would definitely be worth it, the things that God did in order to bring uh, Jerusalem back. But they gave up the other half of it. Well, December 6, 2017, Jerusalem became the united capital of Israel. Amen. And now the next thing will be the building of the third temple. You all, we are, have been brought here at this time and this hour where we will most likely see the second coming of the Lord. We are living right now at a time where good is being called evil. Evil is being called good. Satan is trying to remember we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, though he works through people just like God does. But Satan is trying to change what is morally right and what is morally wrong. <sighs> you all, there's Christians that are giving in to that stuff. 1 Timothy 4.1, now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter days some shall 
depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. And you all, it's really sad. And we need to be standing in the gap for them. We truly do. That God will bring them back home. The fig tree has budded. That prophecy that Jesus himself gave in Matthew 24, verses 35, 32 to 35. When you begin, to, when you see the fig tree bud, know then that the end is near and that that generation would not pass away until all things are fulfilled. And he's speaking of all things from Matthew 24, verses 1 to 31. And we're seeing all of that. The world is in a mess. Wars and rumors of wars are just all over the place. But Jesus said, don't worry, don't fear, for these things must come to pass. And we have to, we have to concentrate, brothers and sisters, on this truth. First Timothy, I think it is. One seven. For God has not given us the spirit of, but of, and of, and of a sound mind. And we need to know that. We need to, to know that the Lord our God is with us. Amen. And we need to, and we're going to talk some more about, about coming to the realization of who we are in Christ, and Christ in us. And, and we can learn a lot of that by reading the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Because you all, when Jesus entered the synagogue, those demons that were in there, they knew who was there. <laughs> they knew who was there. And we need to seek the Holy Spirit for help in coming to that place. Holy Spirit, I don't know how to get there. But Father God said that when you, were, when you would be sent here, that you would be to us as Jesus was to his disciples. Isn't that what the Lord said? You just read uh, John 14, 15, and 16, and you'll, you'll see it two or three times. He is sent to be to us who Christ was to his disciples. Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. So that we can stand strong in this day and realize that the enemy is going to do all he can to pull us away. <laughs> Matter of fact, this morning, a brother came into my office and and, and, and said, I don't know what's going on. I've just been in a battle this week. And, and, and I, I just responded and said, if you obey God, that's going to happen. When you are out there being the child of God that is given to us in the word of God, the enemy is going to come against you. But all you have to do is rebuke him in the name of Jesus. And I want to make this clear to you. You don't ask God to rebuke him. He said, I give you the authority to rebuke him. You tell him, get, get in the name of Jesus. And he will go. And so today we're going to move on, keep moving on in this. And we're going to do some scriptures. Let's go to Luke Okay, my wife has already told me not to get all windy today. <laughs> she can be mean now. <laughs> oh, where is it here? All right, Luke 21. Uh, 
Okay. And verse, verses 34 to 36. This is the Lord Jesus speaking. He is only days away from being crucified. And he is speaking to not just those who were there presently, but to us in the future as well. And the Lord Jesus says, but take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and cares of this life, and that day come on you unexpectedly. For it will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch, therefore, and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Amen. And so, the Lord is telling us that when we come to those latter days, that we need to be busy doing and obeying his word so that we may be accounted worthy to escape those things that are coming after he takes us out. There's going to come a time, and Jesus said to his disciples, they asked when, he said, no man knows the day nor the hour that the Father has set in his own hands, but there's going to come a time when the Lord will appear in the clouds with the trump of God, uh, the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, the voice of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first, and then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Amen. Wherefore, comfort ye one another with these words. And so he's speaking about us being worthy to be taken out of the earth at that time. And remember, we, we were talking about how that a lot of us, and I've been there myself, one foot in the world and one foot in the church. And how that, <laughs> if that's where we are, we are not going to be accounted worthy to escape those things. We are going to get left behind. And you are what the church does not understand. They don't understand Revelation chapter 6 to 20. They have no clue what is coming. That it's going to be a time that is just totally indescribable. My gosh, it's awful is what it is. It's just awful. It's awful. All of the spiritual things that are going to be let, let out of hell to come and torment men and women, the sun scorching people's skin, the earthquake. We say earthquake and the entire planet is going to shake. And that's just one or two of the things. It's just going to be one thing after the next, after the next, after the next. And if a Christian gets left behind, they're going to have to make a choice to lose their head and give themselves over to Satan or refuse to renounce the Lord. Excuse me. If they refuse to renounce the Lord, then they'll be saved. But if they renounce the Lord, they will lose their heads. <laughs> you know, there's all, there's somebody said thousands of guillotines in these FEMA camps all over the country, and nobody knows why they ordered them, you know. Department of Homeland Security, man, what an entity. But God has placed someone in place who is doing away with all that stuff. And that's another thing that the church is not seeing. They have refused to see that God set Donald Trump in the presidency. 
and, in, for, and God to show his hand that I'm with this man because we have, he's broken records. Um, let's just say the Lord has broken records that, that this nation has never, ever experienced. What did I go there for? But the church, the church, it's going to wake up. It's going to wake up. In the meantime, you may suffer persecution from your own brothers and sisters in Christ for what has been revealed to you and you know to be true. And you may get persecuted from your own church. Okay, brethren and sisters. All right, so how are we going to do this? How are we going to put ourselves in a position to be worthy to escape those things? 1 Corinthians 1, 15, 58, and you don't have to turn there, says, Be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, come on, memory. Well, maybe we better go there. Because the rest of it is important. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not vain in the Lord. And so our readiness is going to be based on our steadfastness to the word of the Lord, obeying his word, and, and not being afraid. And this is further played out in 1 Peter 3, verses 8 to 17. If you go there with me, we're going to close out on this. 1 Peter 3, in verses 8 to 17. The Spirit of God speaks through Peter, and he says this, Finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another, love as brothers, be tenderhearted, be courteous, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you are called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. For he who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. And, and here's a, here's a uh, the Lord realizes that we're going to stumble from time to time, and we do. And that's just the truth. We have our moments. And then after we have our moments, Holy Spirit convicts us. And then at that point, we repent. Amen? And you know what repent means? It means we put it behind us and we don't visit that again. Hallelujah. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. And who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? And this, if you go over to Psalm 91, where it says, A thousand will fall at my side and ten thousand at my right hand, but it will not come nigh me. Hallelujah. Amen. For for the Lord gives his angels charge over us to keep us in all our ways, lest we dash our foot against the stone. 
Verse 14, but even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you are blessed. And do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Now, sanctify the Lord in your hearts. <clears throat> that means <clears throat> he is set apart in you, that you look to him for guidance. You look to him for direction. You look to him for needs. You, 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 he is, you have dethroned yourself, and Christ is now upon the throne of your life. He has dethroned self. That's not easy. Come on now. Amen. And it's not easy to do Proverbs 5, 3, verses 5 to 7 either, but we got to do it. For whosoever will save his life, continue on pleasing themselves, will lose eternal life. Verse 18, having a good conscience, that's living without guilt because of the things that we've done. That when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. When once they see that what you said or what you do, it seems like it always works out right, and it does if we're walking in obedience with God. For it is better if the will, if it is the will of God to suffer for doing good rather than for doing evil. And so here we are, you all. When we look at Matthew 24, 32, the, the prophecy about the fig tree, and it speaks of that generation not passing away until all things be fulfilled, a generation is anywhere between 70 and 80 years. So you add 80 years to 1948 and you come up with 2028. And so we're looking through this window. When, and, and as 1 Corinthians 13 says, we see through it darkly because only God knows when he's going to send his son back here. Only God knows. But we need to be ready. Amen. We are closer than when we first believed. And what a glorious day that's going to be. I'm already asking God, God, if there's someone that I love and they don't make it, please, I don't want to know. Because there's some who are not going to make it, y'all. There's some that they're just not in touch with the word of God. <laughs> Prophetically speaking, they don't know where we are. There are so many other references about this period of time of mankind upon the earth. Hosea speaks about six days, the creation six days. On the seventh day, God rested which the seventh day, in this case, is the millennial reign of Christ. We are so close. We are so close, you all. <sighs> so I would recommend that you write this scripture down and every day, wake up and read it and ask Holy Spirit to help you to live it out. Because, let me say this too. A lot of the Lord's second coming will be based upon how much the church is praying. If we say, oh, well, I'm saved, forget those other folks. Mm -hmm. 
then the evil, it will encroach upon us more and more. It will. And it's obvious that God is allowing the enemy to set up things for his period of time when God will allow him to be the head of the new world order. That's what it's called from a natural standpoint, from a spiritual standpoint, it is the tribulation, great tribulation. That's what it is. And when you read there, there the Georgia Guidestones, the Georgia Guidestones there around close to Atlanta, it speaks about what they're going to do. And it, a lot of it really aligns with Revelation verses 6 through 20 because one of their objectives is to reduce the world's population to 500 million people. And we see right there in Revelation 6, one-fourth of all mankind will die in the first three and a half years of the tribulation. You're talking about two billion people there. And then another fourth of humanity takes place, and then a third of humanity takes place. And, the, and the, Matthew says, and if the Lord had not stopped it, no flesh would be saved. They have no idea what they're doing. And these people, a lot of them, you all, these people know that there's a God, but they are convinced that Satan will defeat God. They need to read the Bible. He already been kicked out of heaven once. You know? And I mean, hey man, he came out of there like lightning. <laughs> Bam! When we see the end of the harvest, the last harvest, Matthew 13, I think it is. And the fullness of the Gentiles, Romans 11, 29. When the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And what will precede that is the outpouring of God's spirit. The, the second fulfillment of Joel 2, 28. Even Peter speaks it verbatim in Acts chapter 2. And... Of course, we didn't see blood and fire after the first outpouring because that will happen after the second outpouring, the final harvest. And so we are living in it in the latter days, <clears throat> and we need to put on the whole armor of God. We're going to talk about that too. We're going to have to put on the whole armor of God. And having done all stand. And, and basically what's that saying? If you're not seeing the results that you thought you would see, you stand anyway. Because I'm at work. God does not always do things on our timetable. <laughs> With him, everything is timely. So we just encourage you to just seek the Holy Spirit to help you and I get closer to God. That is my prayer for us, that we would get closer, that we would begin to recognize his voice because brothers and sisters in Christ, he's speaking in us a lot, but we think it's us. And we need to ask Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, Help me to recognize when it's you speaking. Amen. Amen. Yeah, and ask the Father, Father God, open my spiritual eyes and ears to see and to hear what is going on in the realm of the Spirit. Amen. And I tell, I, in my prayer time with our Father, I would say, Father, I want to see what you see. I want to hear what you say. And it's happening. 
It is happening, you all. I wish I could explain it to you, but I can't. I don't. It's so hard to translate the spiritual encounters into a natural dialogue that you understand. Many of you know what I'm talking about. <sighs> Wonderful days ahead. You know something I notice about Jesus Christ? In all that he went through, he never whined. He never got depressed. <laughs> he never got negative. Because he just kept his eyes on the Lord. And knew that he had the victory. And we have the victory. In this world you shall have tribulation. Tests, trials. And he finishes it off by saying, but be of a good cheer. I've overcome everything that you're going to encounter in this life. Amen. Would you stand?